Welcome to another episode of Game Retention, where we're discussing emotional brand loyalty and the impact AI has on that. It's a fascinating subject with a lot of different levels. And the trends this year around loyalty are about personalization, sustainability, digital integration, and how we can improve that customer experience, which is so important. Because as we know, well, Forbes told us that 97% of customers say that customer service interactions impact whether they stay loyal to a brand. The emotional aspect of this is obviously very important. And today I've got Shelley and Katie to discuss this with me. If you could please introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your experience, that would be great. Uh, I'm Shelley Martin. I'm uh, head of marketing um, at Dragonfly AI. I've worked in marketing oh, for more years than I'd like to count, probably about 20. And I've worked for lots of different companies, lots of different brands and lots of different experiences. But I think the thing that's, that's kind of um, really developed over the years is is kind of personalization um, and trying to tap into that kind of emotional loyalty with your, your customers and your customer base. Um, so that's always been a big part of, of my role is how we how we we do that. Hi, I'm Katie Hart. Um, I've probably been in marketing a little bit longer than you have, Shelley. Um, <laughs> and I'm definitely not going to own up to how long. Um, but latterly, I've um, taken quite a niche turn within marketing. So I have um, recently qualified in applied neuroscience. So I now do neuromarketing. And I think really that that has come about because I'm so passionate about looking at the humans within marketing and trying to understand the impact and trying to see how we can influence the way our materials are received within the brains of our, our audiences. Katie, the first question, if I could direct that to you, please. So how does AI contribute to understanding and enhancing the emotional aspects of consumer behavior? And what implications does this have for building a deeper brand loyalty? Uh, it's it's a great question. And I think in fairness, we are probably at the moment only looking at the tip of the iceberg of where this is going to take us. It would be so interesting to have this conversation again in 12 months, 24 months time, because I think we are, pardon the pun, but we are learning as much as the AI is kind of learning too. So, yes, at the moment, there's obviously a lot of ways that, that we can utilize AI. And I think what Starbucks have done have been really playing to the, the, the sort of processing side of it and enabling the, the data capture to, to create a much more rich and detailed picture of the customers and then use that to inform them in terms of the loyalty program that they provide. So it's much more bespoke. It's much more specific. And as a result of that, the customers, I think, feel much more understood and, and valued. And, you know, they're looking at offers that really resonate with them. And I feel that connection is really important. And as you said, the Forbes article says how important customer service is. And I think good customer service makes you feel as though you have a connection with the organization and you're not just a, a number. And, you know, the more we look at AI and the way it's being used, the more opportunities we've got to really kind of galvanize that connection and that relationship. And, and as, you know, as human beings, emotions are a really important part of how we build those relationships. So the more we can demonstrate that we understand and we appreciate the emotions, perhaps the more we can create content or offers which which play to the emotions, I think the more chance we've got to, to get some really robust relationships between ourselves and our customer base. I couldn't agree more. I think um, you touched on kind of the value um, that, that customers need to feel, Katie, and I think that's that's the crucial element. I think if we think about brands like Starbucks they've almost got this kind of celebrity cult like status you know and they almost feel untouchable in in terms of you know you don't feel important to that brand you go in you get your coffee um and you kind of leave and i think these sort of loyalty programs where actually it makes you feel like the brand is aware of you as a customer and you start to get that valued connection i think that's really important i think it's interesting with Starbucks i think at the beginning um they kind of got it a little bit wrong. And I, I think this can happen sometimes with brands where um, they, they, there's obviously a business need behind um, some of these loyalty programs as well. And I think at the beginning when they, they first launched their loyalty app, there was a bit of a transition from 
the way that they were working with, I think it was it was kind of based on, you know, how many coffees you buy or, or whatever, how many purchases you make. And then they switched it to how many dollars you spend. And that had quite a negative impact on the customers. Um, this was back back in the day, kind of years ago. And I think it's obviously changed again since then and, and it's working really well for them now. But I think that comes down to the the AI element as well is kind of understanding what's important to the customers and the emotional reaction that they may have to what, what might seem like a really sensible business decision um, and just, you know, changing the way that the reward structure is. And it can have a huge impact on on kind of that loyalty. So I think there's kind of different ways for brands to look at it but I think the, the emphasis on the emotional importance and the value that that customer needs to feel um, is, is huge um, and I think AI can really help brands to have a, a better understanding of it. Delaware found that consumers increasingly expect exclusivity and white glove treatment and the generation that follows Gen Z is very you know they want they want it now and they want a certain level of service whereas generations before that were not as demanding in their expectations. So how do we think the emotional aspect will ensure that the Gen Zs and the generations that follow get what they expect while still giving the older generations what they need in terms of service? I think this comes down to the way that we shop. Um, and I think there's a really distinct difference in the way that older generation shop they're much more kind of in person they like to go to the store they like to have that kind of experience whereas and I think the, the perhaps the pandemic played a big part in this as well the younger generations tend to be much more kind of online um, and I guess the kind of in-betweens do a little bit of both so I think there's there's a real kind of mix in the way that we shop and I think that plays very importantly into the way that brands then interact with those different experiences and I think having this kind of universal experience across all of those different um, modes of shopping I think is really important and I think AI can play a big part in that you know things like um, when you go to Tesco's uh, getting discounts off the products that um you you often buy that's a huge advantage if you're shopping in store but it's also great if you're shopping online and I think those kind of um, experiences and and uh, across the different modes is, is is hugely important. You talked about the sort of emotional side of it and um, I, I think because the uh, that you know the younger generation they've They've never known any different. So their expectations are that much higher, which actually means that some of the generations, the, the more mature generations, whether we're talking B2C or you know, B2B and professional purchasing as well, they they don't expect the same level. So actually, in terms of emotion, it's it's easier to give them sort of customer delight because they they have that element of surprise when things are incredibly slick or when they've got choice about which platforms they access um, their products or services through or when they've got choice about, you know, whether they want delivery within 24 hours. It, we still have these associations, which mean that for some of the older generations, that is an incredible positive. For the younger ones, that's expected. That's the norm. You know, if I've got to wait till tomorrow, actually, that might feel inconvenient considering that, you know, some some services are available to us instantly. Um, you know, when we're used to streaming things and when we're used to, you know, different providers who get it to us within the same day, actually tomorrow might be disappointing and frustrating. So in terms of looking at the emotions, we need to kind of step back and look at actually what what builds those emotions and a lot of that is our our previous lived experience and so for younger people whose experiences have been much more in this digital environment utilizing these platforms in a more interactive regular basis their emotional experience is going to be completely different from people who have have, have lived through different permutations before we've actually got ourselves to the to the day you know to today and to the different ways that we can engage with organizations today i think brands have kind of almost set this precedent think companies like amazon where you, you you've got same day delivery next day delivery i i personally feel really annoyed when i have to pay for delivery and i have to wait five or six days or pick it up from a store or you know all of those things but I I think it depends on the product and I think it depends on the shop you know for example boots tend you know they they do home delivery but 
you it's cheaper to get it in store but then I go to the store and I pick up other items and I'm you know I buy other things so there's I think it depends on the brand and it depends on kind of the way that you shop in those particular stores um I think that it it can it can kind of impact the way that you you know you can you could buy a lot more if you're in in the store so I think any companies that can kind of draw you in um will will benefit from that. Mondelez has utilized AI in blending online and offline consumer experiences which is very similar to the boots example you just gave. How do you think this integration impacts the emotional connection between consumers and brands like Oreos and what role can AI play in these? I think just kind of what what I've touched on really I think that that seamless interaction between the online shopping versus in store I think any brands that can take advantage of that and and create that kind of personalized experience and and using boots again I think things like the boots card um the same with with the, the kind of club card that Tesco's do all of these brands are kind of cottoning onto this now it's really great because I can shop online um and I get I get points and then I can go into the store and I'm I'm more likely to kind of pick up other products. So I think if brands can kind of tap into that and and create a way of um, engaging with the customer at, at all of these different points, it really does create that kind of loyalty. I'm far more likely to buy products from uh, Boots when it comes to beauty products because of that that um, the points and the experience that I have with them as opposed to shopping in say Superdrug even though possibly in Superdrug it's it's cheaper um so they they've kind of got me through that um that brand loyalty scheme that they've created and and using kind of AI to track the products that I buy and things that I like it's created a personalized experience for me and and I'm it's working I'm I'm into it um and I think um any brand that can do that and can kind of create that across those different shopping experiences is always going to is always going to hold that that emotional connection and that that value. I think you're absolutely right, and I think I think perhaps the other way that we can look at including this is instead of using it just to to drive people's decisions in terms of whether they go into Boots or whether they go into Superdrug, but actually we can look at how we are now reaching out into their lives so you know when we look at some of these um campaigns and it it builds so much of the the sort of personality now behind these brands um and the way that we can utilize this through social media means that actually we're no longer waiting until people need to make a purchase to either come onto the boots platform or go into a boots store we can actually be communicating a huge amount about uh, the boots experience and the boots values for instance while they're sitting at home, not even thinking consciously about making a purchase from Boots. So it it really enables us to leverage that that connection. And again, I think when we talk about brands having personality, we're naturally leaning on that that emotional need that we have and and those sort of fundamental aspects which build on the connections so that we we engage with that brand in a much more meaningful and um hopefully profitable way. I think it's interesting how um, what you said earlier about relationships and now following up with the connection aspect, because there are certain brands that have a lot more personality nowadays. They're not afraid to have personalities like Surreal and Who Gives a Crap and Oatly. And I want to engage with them because they're fun. And it sounds like we're having like a feel part of the conversation. It's not a stuffy marketing campaign that I can't relate to. And I really like how they're kind of shifting the guidelines on this and being a little more brave. We've got to ultimately be driven by what the customer's need is and what their emotional connection is likely to be. So you've got to pe- keep championing for the customer and fighting their corner. And hopefully the analytics and the, the metrics show that actually it's these personal connections that that do get the traction, that do get the engagement. And, and you know, it might be a bit a bit awkward, a bit uncomfortable for some of us as organizations to open up and feel a bit more vulnerable in terms of what we're sharing. But I think as customers, a lot of us, as you say, are, we're looking for that. We're looking for something that's a bit different. And so, you know, it's always a case of coming at it from the customer's side, not what we perhaps want to do or how we perhaps want to present ourselves. I think it's, I think it's really interesting when it's a brand where 
um, you know, we work a lot with kind of CPG brands and um, that's kind of our sort of target audience. But I think for us, with from a, from a technical perspective, obviously you kind of want to showcase the product and you want to demonstrate the the incredible technology that's that's kind of supporting the product but at the same time you know customers don't often care about that they they want to know how it's going to fix problems that they have in their day-to-day jobs in their day to how it's going to make their lives easier and that's that's the real challenge i think from a, from a marketing perspective within within a SaaS business is trying to find that balance between um really demonstrating and showcasing how great the product is but also how it's going to fix those problems for your customer. I think the other aspect to all of this is that actually some of those um, more personal, um, perhaps more lighthearted, the less sort of technical side are actually part of what makes us more memorable. And, you know, even if that customer doesn't have a particular need today, it's likely that your brand, your name will, will have created just some kind of connection within their brain and that you can build on that overcoming content that, that comes over future, future weeks and months. And it's all about nurturing that relationship and realizing that it doesn't all have to be about a sale here and now. And so sometimes we need to be looking at the, the opportunity to create memorability rather than actually try and push that technical side and push the benefits and the sale too hard because if now isn't the optimum time for that purchase essentially we've done ourselves a disservice because they're not interested now and they're not going to remember us in future so it's always that sort of double edge of of creating something that has a bit of a legacy within people's brains as well so that we can then build that brand and those connections over over future weeks and months yeah, I feel like that's hugely important for a brand like like ours, where um, you know when when you've got a high kind of value on the product, people aren't going to make a, a, a irrational purchase. That you know that's something that they've got to think about. They've got to look at their budgets. So that memorability factor is is absolutely key for us. The thing that I have learned from doing the social media, it does give me that opportunity to try different things, to try different ways to connect with the human behind the ICP, the persona, the, you know, the human behind that. And social, because it's so quick and because there's so much of it, I have come to develop a relationship with it because of the data it gives us. Well, this then means that I can try new things and the experimentation on how to connect with that person behind that is so much faster. Yeah, uh, which I haven't found in obviously blog content and stuff like it doesn't give me the same return. So social has been an interesting one for kind of the emotional aspect to see where it lands and the quick turnaround of that. Looking at PepsiCo's implementation of AI in the Joy customer loyalty app, how do you see AI transforming the traditional notions of customer loyalty into more emotionally resonant and personalized experiences? I think probably the key for for this particular example is the pace and and the change of pace and the ability it really feeding on from what you said about um your experiences of social media is that that immediacy of response that you get and and it feels from this example as though actually it has completely transformed the um the process behind their sort of data capture so instead of it being you know one or two weeks this is now down to a matter of seconds and and that i think that is going to really revolutionize the way that we can connect with our loyal customers and it's going to enable us to be able to explore those emotions on a completely different level because we're not we're no longer having to wait a couple of weeks before we get that data and those insights back they are almost in real time and i think that that is is just literally going to open up and make it much more of a of a conversation so instead of it being quite so transactional it can become much more conversational and and we can have backwards and forwards and and you know i i just think that that is going to completely change the way organizations and their customer base interact i think there's a there's a big element that 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 AI is helping with and I think that's accuracy and I think being able to have really accurate right now information is so critical to that experience feeling seamless and I think the seamlessness is 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 so important to the customer 
you know, we, we, our attention span is so limited uh, these days and we're bombarded by information from brands all over the place in, in all experiences that we have throughout, throughout our day. So I think that kind of seamless, accurate um, interaction is, is hugely important. And I think AI is, is massively helping with that. I had um, an experience recently, um, which kind of which kind of really brought this to, to light for me a little bit on the personalization front. I, I, I made a purchase of a, a nail kit online and they had this really great a series of emails that they sent me. They were very personalized. They were all addressed to me, um, you know, with my name all the way through the email. There was videos. There was all of these different things. And it was great. And it was a really wonderful experience until it got to the point where they asked me to review the product. And I received an email that said, um, we'd love to hear what you think test. <laughs> Um, and it completely threw me because I hadn't really realized how engaged I was with the with these emails that were personalized to me until they weren't. Um, and it, you know, it happens to us all as a marketer. There's been numerous times where, where these sorts of things, it's so simple to do and so easy a mistake to make. But the impact that it had on on my experience with that brand was was huge. And I, I and I wasn't even aware of it until it went wrong. Um, so I think the the importance of AI and bringing in that kind of accuracy that it can help with, um, I think, is is critical to to these sorts of things being successful. And I think that's a really great point, Shelley, is that actually a lot of the potential we have here is to build trust. Mm. And, you know, in that example that you used, it sounded like they had done a superb job of that and, and you were pulled in and you felt valued and, you know, they were giving you great content, which was going to be tremendously useful for you. And and so you were trusting them. And, mm. you know, that if, if we'd looked at what was going on in your brain, that would have been a hugely positive thing. You'd have had dopamine and anticipation and everything is firing off in a lovely way. And then it was just destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> It and, was, and, it was. And to, uh, to have got so far and to have done so much to create those positive associations, it's devastating to hear of that, you know, that complete 180 degree pivot where suddenly you're not valued anymore. You know, we, mm. you, you're on your own. You're one of one of many. And, yeah. and, you know, that must have felt, you know, literally as an emotion, you must have felt quite rejected by that, quite hurt by that. Yeah. And I think, again, that's where AI can really come into the emotional connection is this idea of trust and and building and demonstrating and establishing that kind of credibility and ensuring that our processes are optimized so that everything reinforces what's happened before and it builds up. You know, we literally layer up the, the good examples and and then hopefully sustain that the whole way through. I think it's interesting because and I. I want to ask you this, Katie, because of the neuromarketing thing. In terms of kind of authenticity, do our brains respond in the same way to that personalization, even though we know it's AI driven? Is there a difference between a human to human connection as opposed to an AI to human connection? And how do we navigate that as AI takes on more and more jobs and tasks and, um, creation over the coming years it's a really interesting question isn't it and i think a you know a bit like what i said right at the start it's something that we are we're exploring but i think it's going to become much more meaningful um i'm always intrigued um and sort of smile to myself when you see people particularly on platforms like linkedin who talk about oh you can always tell the content that's been sort of generated using ai and I think actually, um, we might like to think we can, but I, I think there is this huge disparity between what we are consciously aware of and what we are subconsciously picking up on. Uh, uh, definitely, I mean, categorically, human to human connection is something that is, it, it's built into us. You know, even the desire to feel connected is built into us and a lot of the the success of these platforms ironically are built on the fact we are connecting humans to humans um it is going to be very interesting to see how the brain responds because our brain is not designed it's not fit for purpose it's not coping with this it doesn't cope with virtual reality it's very easily fooled by a lot of the kind of cues which have served it very well through most of our evolutionary past 
And now within the last decades, we've, we've created ways to fool it. And so I think there are ways that our brain is going to fall for it. I think it's going to actually, um, you know, uh, believe in a lot. And I particularly am worried about some of the, the sort of more image based content, because I think when you look at how easy it is to manipulate images as a brain, our visual system is incredibly dominant and we place great weight on what we can see. Um, and I think that's going to be really hard for us to kind of educate ourselves out of that. And I know, you know, some of the videos that I've seen that I know have been created artificially, you almost have to consciously, rationally talk to yourself and say, it's not real. I know it's not real. But but still, there's a, a large amount of me that's that's believing that and going along with it. So I think it's going to be really interesting. And I think my suspicion is that the AI is going to get a lot more effective, a lot more intricate um, and, and perhaps a lot more efficient, faster than our brains are going to be able to keep up with it. So I, I feel it's got great potential for us. As a marketer, I'm on the positive side and thinking it's got great potential for us. As a consumer, I'm slightly concerned about <laughs> potentially where this is going to take us to. But I definitely think, you know, our brain is... It's, you know, it's old technology. And when we look at what's happening with AI, um, there is no way that our brain is going to be able to keep up with it. This is a very controversial uh, topic, isn't it? That the kind of line, the blur between, you know, the use of AI in a positive way and then the kind of more negative things. And I think the fact that we live our lives so um, online these days, it takes away a lot of the of our brain's ability to read people properly you know you lose the body language you 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 lose the kind of emotional connection that you have in person um so i think it's very difficult as you say for our brains to then distinguish what we would normally use then you know visual cues sound all of that can then be mimicked by ai it's really challenging for our brains but i guess the other angle of this is does it matter um you know if we're reading content that's written by ai or by a person, I, I I think the personal element always always has to have a you know it has to have a person behind it, um, and I think the content that we engage with the most is going to be that that has had that personal touch and that and that 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 kind of human element. But you know, in terms of kind of other other bits and pieces, I think I think there's 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 lines that can be crossed a little bit here, and I think it's it's really interesting. I think as AI develops and becomes um, more intrinsic in our lives. Um, I think the the boundaries are inevitably going to be blurred. And, and you're right, you know, we can't always tell the difference. Um, you know, we'd, we'd like to think that the human um, interaction is 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 much more um, important and, and that we'll be able to, to, to distinguish that. But I don't know. I don't know whether we will as time goes on and whether that whether that really matters whether the content we're engaging with from a brand perspective if we're getting a, a, a tailored experience for us does it matter whether it's with a with an actual human or a, or a robot I don't know I, I you know it's it's a controversial topic um and I think we're a little way off actually having that kind of engagement with you know on a on a call or something like that with with a with a with a robot essentially i mean you've only got to use some of the pop up chatbots to realize that we're we're a way off that yet because they're just you know usually terrible um but i it's a, it's a certainly a very controversial topic and i think the lines are definitely blurring and i think you know that's that's only going to continue and, and become more and more of a of a a difficult thing to to distinguish um but i but whether it's you know i personally i don't think it's a particularly positive thing i think we all w can probably agree that having a, a an interaction with a human is much more valuable but i think the internet has kind of taken the emphasis of that away a little bit and so yeah those lines will will definitely be crossed over the over the coming years and it might be something that ends up being a real differentiating factor between brands that actually yeah. we as customers make our choice. You know, I can either go into um, 
uh, I'm just trying to think of which restaurant restaurant it was I went into recently where your your food is brought to your table by a robot and you know okay wow. and that's great and you know with the kids it was a, a a fantastic kind of gimmick but the atmosphere that created was very different from if I was perhaps going out on date night or something else so I think it might be a factor that actually we can choose to really immerse ourselves in where the technology and and where the AI and things are going to going to be much more prominent or we can actually look for and seek out those human to human connections and mm. you know there's there's lots of different ways that brands do compete with each other and it might be that this is something that that we see coming to the fore and people actually advocating and saying what you know we're taking a stand on this and you phone us up you will get a human and it might yeah. mean the, the service or the product costs you more but if that's what you value and those interactions are meaningful and important to you on that emotional connection, you know, step this way. Mm. And I, I think, you know, I, we've often had these experiences, haven't we, where, we, where you call up your bank or you call up and you've got to go through this hideous process with a robot before you actually speak to a human. So, you know. I'm still going to want to speak to a human. And I think I, I speak for everybody when I when I say that, you know, it, it really irks me that I have to go through this ridiculous process before I, you know, I get it from a brand perspective. It, it's time saving, it's, it's cost efficient, and it's not the end of the world if you get through to a person at the end. But it does add incredible frustration for the customer, I think, um, particularly if you're in a rush and particularly, you know, if you're if you you know if you're frustrated by the brand you're often kind of calling somebody because you you know there's a problem or something and you know this this kind of delay just makes that that worse so i think from a customer experience perspective it's going to be a very important and as you say distinguishing um part of that experience with that brand and i think people will always opt to pay perhaps pay slightly more but have that have that human interaction is there anything worse than I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. <laughs> <laughs> in a really condescending voice as well, which um, just I'm... enrages you. <laughs> I, know. I, I always, I always get to me where I'm like, no! <laughs> <laughs> I can see that, you know, it does, for some people, it creates perhaps accessibility or it means people are uh, not people but organizations are available 24 7 in a way that they may not be able to have been before i can see there are lots of advantages but uh, yeah from a, a neuroscience side i still think that as you say shelley you know we do we do value we do appreciate those interactions and i think you know the pandemic and lockdown and everything showed us how much we struggle when we're deprived of those and, mm. and as you say looking at what goes on in our brain in a very digital two-dimensional world it's not good for us and it starts to stifle creativity and you know anxiety levels become heightened and stress creates physiological um, issues as a result of it as well so I think we need to be very careful about how much of this actually we do use to replace those human to human interactions. And I think, you know, we we need to do it mindfully and not just sort of blunder into this in a way which, you know, it's exciting. It's the latest thing. And, you know, there are there are benefits. There are obviously cost benefits for a lot of organisations in engaging with it, too but kind of at what cost and i think that's the that's the sort of line that i'm you know very aware of at the moment is yes i can see that we gain benefits in these areas but what other problems are we creating for ourselves further down the line potentially the way i kind of see it is ai is a helping hand to humans and that's how it yeah. should be and that's how we need to keep it yeah. um i know obviously the bank system with the automation is very irritating mm -hmm. But then you have apps like uh, Flow that are the chatbots are really helpful. Um, you don't want to go to a doctor every time you have a headache. You don't want to go to a doctor, especially if it's hormonal. And, you know, the engagement on that app, it's one of the best that I've seen because it's so personalized to you and your cycle and how you're feeling. And it, it's at all levels, whether you're trying to conceive or you're pregnant or you're perimenopausal or menopausal. and I think it's a great example of how it can give you that additional support before you take it to a medical professional or, mm. you know, to help you track things before you see someone. So that's how I kind of 
see it as AI kind of lifting us up as humans and making things more efficient and more effective. But I do think, as you've both said, there is a danger of going too far the other way and getting that kind of inauthenticity and losing that emotional connection. Um, it's obviously not a very good idea, but people like shortcuts. Yep. And I mean, save money. you know, yeah, save money, make more money, and it's quicker and faster. So yeah. the quality and the value might not be there, but it's going to help my bottom line. And it means that I can get rid of these 12 people. I don't know. We're just going to have to wait and see where it lands. It, it kind of raises the the start point, raises the foundation for that human interaction. And whether you're using it for something like Flow and the, the app that you've described, or whether you're using it to write blog posts or content, we're not saying take what is created and use it verbatim. But we've all been in those situations where you've got a blank sheet of paper and you're just not feeling any sense of inspiration. And if you turn to AI for some of those prompts, even if it gets you 40%, 50% of, of something, it's much easier to, to edit and to start from that and use it to, to stimulate more ideas and perhaps take you off in a, in a research tangent. Brilliant. It, it's worked for you. So I think you're right that it's, it's a tool and I think it's going to become an increasingly big part of what we all do but mm. for for most of us I think it is a it's a resource that we can use and we can kind of add it to our toolkit and I think it's a case of knowing where the benefits are so as a, as we've discussed where it speeds up your ability to engage meaningfully with your audience that's brilliant but it may be that that engagement actually goes back to being personal but it's based on data which has been generated through ai and which has been processed in a far quicker way as a result of it so it's really looking at i suppose the whole customer journey and seeing where where is it important to our customer that we maintain those human interactions and we give them the opportunities to select to still access our products or services via more human approaches and actually where can we then speed up what goes on behind the scenes and you know how how much does AI support us and enable us to do that more efficiently and more accurately than we currently are doing yeah I couldn't agree more I think you know I think remembering that it has its limitations and that it's not a, a, a you know a, a complete solution um, and there does still need to be a human that oversees um, the work that it's that it's doing. I think, as as you said, it's it's definitely a, a good support um, and a great resource. Um, but I think there there still has to be that kind of oversight. And and yeah, you're completely right. Looking at the customer journey and seeing where it's appropriate and where it isn't, I think is is crucial. Well, I'm going to bring us to an end there. Um, thank you both so much for your insights. It's been really great having you both. And I think that we should reconvene in a year's time and um, see where we've got and how we're getting on and what's changed. I think it would be really interesting to look back and see kind of where we are 12 months from now. Um, but again, thank you so much for your time. And I really appreciate you being here. Thank you. You're welcome. Many thanks.